we're going to jump back into our Colossians series. And what we've been doing every week this week is we're going to uh, just read the scripture together. And so we'll be in Colossians chapter three. If you want to open up your Bible, if you don't have one with you, it's going to be on the screen. But I just want to invite everyone to stand as we honor the reading of God's word. My wife is going to actually come up. So if you wouldn't greet my wife, Katie, can I'm going to read. Good morning. So this is Colossians three, starting at verse 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Thanks, babe. You guys are going to grab a seat. Man, hey, so we good We good this week? Yeah. Feeling good? Dads, did you have a good Father's Day last weekend? Yeah. I was lackluster. <laughs> I hope next year's Father's Day is better for you. I'm just kidding. Um, Father's Day was pretty great for us. We, uh, I mean, full, full morning here at the church, and then we, we left the building here at like 12, 30, 1 o'clock, uh, went home, grabbed a couple last minute things. Katie had already gassed the car up, and we went camping for a couple days. Uh, which was super fun, super awesome, and always super good to be home. Anyone else feel that when they talk about camping? Um, I I, I realized, I think on my way home, that I didn't didn't put deodorant on since Sunday morning when I left, you know? And uh, I don't think I even, I don't think I even really changed my shirt. And it, like, I had done some four-wheeling, went through some mud, like, I was gross. And I can only imagine what our car actually smelt like if I wasn't, like, the one in it. You know what I mean? And I think, as silly as this is, this really is, this really is chapter three of the book of Colossians. That like the moment that you, that you get home, uh, for those non-campers, it's like the moment of salvation, right? You're like, oh my gosh, I've arrived back home. Praise the Lord, I'm not in the mountains anymore. This is amazing, right? Uh, but then what we've been walking through last week and now this week is, is putting to death what's still earthly in us as Christians. So as we've had this moment of salvation, this moment of conversion, really, where we have, now have a new heart in us and we are following after Jesus, what that entails now for us is, is putting to death or putting off our earthly way of living, our old way of living, and, and putting on, which is this week, the life found in Christ, the life of Christ. And so really, it's kind of like uh, the invitation, like when you get home from camping, really just to change your clothes. Like, like hey, you're home, you're saved, welcome, uh, but take those clothes off. They nasty, okay? Just like put those away, shower up a little bit, and put on some new clothes. Amen? Like, so that, that's kind of where we're at in the, in the the language that's rich in this text is that of clothing, that we're, that we're taking off the garments that are, that are filthy, that make us feel bad and make us feel ashamed. And we're putting on the free gift of Christ's righteousness. And that's producing something in us in a way to walk and in a way to live our life now as Christians. And that's really what we're getting into here in Colossians in the back half of chapter three. And so I want to just walk through this. I think there's three aspects really that, this, that the, these few verses are going to show us about what it means to be a Christian. Because I think all of us, if we're honest, uh, we can see and we realize that there, there's a gap between the person or the Christian that we want to be or that we know we should be maybe and the person that we are right now. We recognize there's some distance between that person who we hope to be someday or who we wish to be like or Jesus who we're aiming after and then, and then the person who we are right now. And, and the way that we close that gap is by, is by continually putting off what was earthly in us, putting off the life we had before Christ and putting on his righteousness that he offers to us. And, and, and this, is, this is where we start. Like I said, three aspects in verse 12 is where we get it going. He says in at the very opening part, he says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. So, so the first thing that we're going to confront, we're going to look at is God's identity that he's given to us. God's identity that he's offering to us. Because what, what I'm going to show you here is that you can't, you can't demonstrate God's character until you receive his identity. So you, you, can't, you can't act like a Christian. You can't do Christian things until you embrace the identity that he's offering to you. And the first three things that he lists there in Colossians 12 is he says, put on then as God's chosen holy and beloved children. 
So, so the first one, you're chosen. God, God saved you. He picked you. It's adoptive language. He, he could have picked any kid in the world. He picked you. He said, no, no, no. You, like you, son, you, daughter, you're mine. You belong to me. You didn't earn that. You didn't deserve that. There was nothing, no, no merit that you accumulated through your life. There was nothing that I was like looking for you to prove or looking to get access to in my kingdom now that I saved you. But he just goes, no, hey, I choose you. Come follow me. And we're chosen, but we're not just chosen. He also calls us holy. He calls us holy. He says, this, this is my beloved son whom I'm pleased with. Like you're holy in the eyes of God. And, and the problem is that we have with this is, is we don't feel holy. We don't feel holy. We know the things that we thought this last week. We know the things that we did last week. And we just heard the Sermon on Sin. And the Sermon on Sin last week, just if you weren't here, you could have heard a pin drop on the carpet as we were walking through that sermon, right? It was just, it was like, man, and it's intense and it's heavy, but it's, it's this reminder that no, sin matters. Jesus went to the cross and he paid for my sin. So I don't have to dwell in it, but I ought to take it seriously. I need to put it to death. I don't, I don't want to tolerate it or just kind of like entertain it. I need to kill the sin that's still in my heart. And the reason that is because he, God calls us holy even before we feel holy. Do, are you tracking with that? Like, does that make sense to you? Like he calls you holy before you actually start acting holy. To be holy is to be, to be set apart, to be distinct, uh, to, be, to, be, to be so important in value, to be so like recognized as, uh, as royalty. Like you and I, we belong, we are sons, daughters of the most high king. And so we, our, our bloodline now is that of, of royal heritage. And so we're not going to act like the rest of the world. We're not going to act normal. We're going to act distinct to be set apart, to look different than the world around us. That's what it means to be holy. God calls us holy. He calls us, he calls us chosen, but he also calls us beloved. Beloved, you are loved by God. The same God that we talk about in Colossians chapter one, that's so mighty and so profound and so beyond our human comprehension. He loves you. He loves you. And, and this is kind of two things that happen when we hear that. Either you're, you're really in touch with your emotions and you're kind of a more emotional person naturally. And you hear that and you just kind of, you just kind of cuddle up to that like a, like a warm blanket on, on a rainy afternoon. You just want to nap with it. And you're just like, yes, I am loved. And, that, and that's beautiful. That's good. Like you should emote at that. Others of us, like, like even I think myself included, uh, I'm not as maybe in touch with my emotions as I like to be. And so I hear like, man, God loves me. And I kind of go, all right, cool, <laughs> you know? But what you need to hear that as, if that's you and you're not like so as emotional of a person, you need to hear that like it's, it's your dad saying, hey, son, daughter, I love you. I, I, I'm pleased with you. I'm so thankful that you belong to me. You are loved. You're loved. And on all these things, they, they really, they start to define the identity that Christ is offering to us. And here's, here's, what, here's what I'll tell you. You, you will always do uh, whatever you identify with. So, so if, I, if I internally identify as an alcoholic, if I internally identify as this, as that, as a troublemaker, as someone who can't do this, like you're, you're going to live up to whatever identity you most closely and dearly embrace for yourself. And so the opportunity here is if you are following Jesus, your deepest identity, the truest part of who you are is chosen, holy, and loved. And if you embrace that identity for yourself, then God's character will be demonstrated out of you. It won't be something that you have to try and muster up. Putting to death the sinful parts of you and putting on the good life and the character qualities of God won't be difficult because you'll say, no, this is who I am. I am not that thing that I did. I am not that mistake I made last year. I am not that person. I am this person. So I'm going to continue to walk this way. That, this, is, this is why Christianity is not about moral betterment or making you a who was a bad person, a good person. Christianity is making dead people alive. So that my, actual, my dead heart has now been transformed and rearranged that now I long for the things of God because my deepest identity belongs to him, belongs in him. And as you embrace that identity, it will outwardly demonstrate itself in your, in your attributes, in your character, the way that you walk, the way that you carry yourself. So the first, the first step as we put on the life of Christ is to embrace the identity that he's called us into. And we never, we never move on from that right? We, some of us, man, how many of you know, you got to come back to that morning by morning. 
You just got to continually remind yourself, nope, this is who I am. Nope, this is who I am. This is who I am. This is who I belong to. And as we embrace that identity, the next, we start to demonstrate these, these godly characteristics. And he goes in this list here in verse 12. Put on then, God, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. So we're just going gonna to unpack these as we go. To be a compassionate person is really to be able to think of or empathize with others. And so you care about others, specifically and namely others who are hurting or who are broken. And, and here's what I've learned about compassion over the years is that uh, I've got compassion in spades for people I love. My kids make a mistake. I'm like, oh, hey, it's okay. Like you didn't hear. Like, oh, I, I'm sorry you made that mistake. And I, I can feel compassionate, like incited because of how much I love them. I have, if I have friends and they make dumb decisions, I'm like, hey, it's okay. Fine. Get in here. I, 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 can, I can see past that and I can empathize with you. It's a lot more difficult, how many of y'all know this, to be compassionate for people who you don't necessarily roll with all the time. The people on your Facebook feed who you do not agree with. I, I met with this guy for probably like two years a while back. And, and um, you know, over the course of meeting, he would continue to ask me like, hey, what's your, what's your input on this? Like, what should I do here? I'm kind of in this situation. He was asking me to disciple him. He was asking me for some wisdom. And so I would share it. I'd say, hey, if I were you, this is kind of what I would do. And, and he just, God bless his heart, just repeatedly did the opposite of what I said. <laughs> and, and at first, I'm just like, hey, it's okay. It's okay. Hey, come on. It's okay. I, I have this compassion. I can see the better for you. I can continually meet with you. And, and then, man, how many of y'all know, after like a year, I just got hard. And it's kind of like, bro, you're not going to listen to me anyways. It, we can lack compassion easily if we forget how compassionate God has been to us. How many of you are thankful that, that, I mean, I've been following Jesus for 10, 12 years now, and, and I, I'm so grateful that God's response to my sin at this point is not just like, you idiot. We've been over this before. We've talked, you've made this same mistake plenty of times. How many times are we going to have to deal with this? But no, like God is still compassionate towards me. He's still caring. He's still tender. He's still loving for me. And if I neglect compassion in some area of my life, I need to run back to the compassion that's been extended to me from God. So we're compassionate, but we're also kind. We're also kind. To be kind is to be, to be thinking of others. So it's not just like I sit down with you and I have the conversation, uh, hey, how are you doing? Hey, I'm good. How are you doing? Not as just like the formal part of conversation that we have, but we actually say, no, like, how are you? Are you good? Hey, how? okay, wait, that happened. How, how did that make you feel? Are you doing okay? Like we actually think and care for others. Another way that you could say kindness is to have this like sweet disposition. Like you're just a sweet, sweet person to be around. A fragrant, like it's just like, it's just good. It's refreshing to be around you. Uh, how's our culture doing in this one right now? Yeah? Like not so hot, right? And, and, and what a unique time for the church to embrace this kind of countercultural way of living that we're able to be kind to people who are just, who are just uh, never kind to us. Because again, here, here's, here's where all this is going. Jesus was kind to, uh, to me first. And so therefore, because I've embraced his kindness towards me, I can now be kind towards people who are nothing like me. Like God is so kind. You, you know, like the kindness of God is, is so bountiful. Like he, he blesses people who curse him. Like his, his common grace, the good gifts of God's grace are available for people who are in open rebellion and mocking his name right now. And he's still letting them enjoy good things that he's made. God is so kind. He's so kind. He's also so humble. Humility. Humility and meekness. Your, your version might say gentleness. Humility and meekness. Uh, these are not virtues of Paul's day when he's writing this letter to the church in Colossae. And they're also not virtues of our day. People don't, people don't look at people who are like humble and meek and go, man, there's somebody I really want to be like. We want the go-getters and the, and the people who take ground and the people who are oh, just so intense and so passionate. And I'm not knocking those things, but like we, we idolize people who are, who are acting like they're above where they really are. That's, that's opposite of humility. Humility is recognizing your place and operating within your, who you really are. And then meekness is, is not acting like you have this great power that's on great display. It's great power that's under great control. Yeah, so, so meekness, we often think of it as like weakness, people who are a pushover, people who are easy to steamroll. But meekness is the dad who wrestles with his kid at the end of the day and doesn't just crush him. Do you know what I mean? 
like, like a, a big tough dad coming home from work, having a long day, and his little kid wants to just wrestle and beat him up, and he just kind of lets him. Because it's, it's, this, it's this power, but it's also the ability to be tender with that power. And this is Jesus towards us. Again, the greatest, most powerful being ever, and yet he's, he's tender, and he's gentle, and he's loving, and he's easy to talk to, and kids want to be around him. He's meek. He's also, he's also patient. Patience is a godly character that we need to display. And patience in this context is not the ability to wait. Um, so I don't know how y'all feel about this, but like my, my patience is being tested right now in my ability to wait. Like I, I'm conditioned at this point. Amazon has, has created me to, to just know that like I get free two-day shipping no matter what I buy, <laughs> Right? Like it's just, and now all of a sudden Amazon, and it's like, it's because of COVID and all these supply chains are messed up or whatever, Suez Canal and the ship's all jammed in there. And now all of a sudden Amazon Prime is like, no, 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 it's going to be like three weeks. And I'm like, what? <laughs> three weeks? Like I ordered that bug spray in plenty of time for this camping trip and it's not going to get here till we get home? <laughs> and I lose my mind because I'm impatient, but that's not actually the kind of patience that's being talked about right here. That's a good kind of patience. We, we should grow in that kind of patience. I'm cheating. I'm trying to try and best I can to teach my kids how to grow in that kind of patience to be able to wait. But this word is actually long suffering. It's, it's the, the ability to be, to be, um, to be, to be insulted or to be, to suffer without, without snapping. To be able to, to be able to like turn the other cheek would be Jesus' language. To be able to take something and not immediately react to it. But I'm able to actually just like suffer with it. Not, not, not compromising on my values. Not bending over on what I believe in. But, but I'm willing to, to sit and endure. And I'm not lashing out towards people who are lashing out towards me. This is patience. Uh, so again, like I've been saying, every single one of us, as we read this list, there are things that I'm reading through and I'm like, compassionate hearts. And you're like, Ooh, you're like, yeah, I need to work on that. Or kindness. Yeah. I need to, or some of y'all are just like the whole list, please. Like I need every single bit of it. I'm lacking in all of it. And the temptation is in this moment is for you to go like, okay, well, I, I'm going to hop on a blog. I'm going to get a podcast. I'm going to buy a book, 10 ways to be a more patient human being or something ridiculous like that. And you're going to read that and it's going to give you a couple tools and it's going to help you for like three seconds. And they're going to lose your mind because like the, the web page didn't actually load fast enough for you to read it. And you're struggling with impatience. So you freak out. But what this actually takes for us to grow in this character is to first, remember, it's to run back to our identity that's in Christ. I'm holy, I'm chosen, I'm beloved. But the second thing is to then meditate on these and to ask myself, okay, God, show me how you've been kind to me. And the greater my understanding of God's character and attributes towards me, the greater my capacity to be able to demonstrate them to the world that I'm living in. That, that's the only way. You, you, can, you can get the podcast. You can understand different things. You can read a book if you want to. But until you understand that God has been long-suffering with you, knuckleheads, me, chief knucklehead, right? <laughs> until I understand that God has been meek, that he could have obliterated me, but he was tender with me instead. That, that he's been, he was so humble. There's never been an act, there never will be an act so humbling as the incarnation, stepping all the way from heaven to earth. Until you grasp that these are things that God has first shown to you, you'll never be able to show them to the world. And so read the book, get on the blog, get on the podcast. But don't neglect the fact that every single one of these, if you want to grow in them, takes meditation on how God has been this to you, to you. So you can't do any of these alone. And so the first aspect that we have to talk about as we're putting on the new life in Christ is, is me receiving the identity that God's freely offering to me in Jesus. And I embrace that identity, but then I also start to demonstrate these character qualities. And as I demonstrate these character qualities, the verse then goes to growing in Christian community. So let me show it to you. Bearing with one another in verse 13. Bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, oh, pause real quick. Paul's assuming you're already going to mess this up. Anyone else just find that refreshing? He's like, hey, do this. And then when you screw up, do this. <laughs> Amen. So you're like, it's like when you have a complaint against another, forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must also forgive. I, I, I 
wish I had a whole sermon, a whole series to go into on unforgiveness. But here's the gist of it. If you are unwilling to forgive someone, then you're essentially asking God to treat you one way in a way that you're unwilling to treat somebody else. There is nothing that somebody has done to you that was more offensive or more egregious than the things that you have done to God. And if you need help understanding this, go read the parable of the unforgiving servant where this insurmountable debt was paid. That's Jesus paying your debt, forgiving you, forgiving me. And, and, then, and then that servant goes off and he's, and he's unwilling to give a servant that owes him a debt that's a fraction of what he owed the master before. And in, in his unwillingness, he shows, he reveals that he actually hasn't really received the gift of forgiveness from God because he's unwilling to extend it to somebody else. And so, listen, unforgiveness is not the same as reconciliation. It's not. Somebody may have done something to you, and that relationship may be forever different, even if you do forgive them. And you should know that. That doesn't just mean you keep going back to somebody in the same way that you did before. If they did something awful to you, you're called to forgive them. That does not mean you'll necessarily reconcile. It's also true that unforgiveness is not the same thing as trust or mistrust. As in, if somebody does something to me, that does not mean uh, that I have to fully trust them in the same way. I can completely forgive you and still have some issues trusting you. And that's okay too. So, so like I'll, Pastor Brady says this, uh, trust is earned in drips and lost in buckets. Isn't that good? Earned in drips and lost in buckets. If somebody does something to you, does something to your family, does something to, to someone you love, and they lose buckets full of trust, it's understandable and it's just the way it works that that trust is going to be built back up again over time. So, okay, Austin, how do I know if I have unforgiveness for somebody? Um, here's, here's how you know if you have unforgiveness for somebody. Let me say that differently. Here's how I know when I have unforgiveness for somebody. Um, I start having these fake conversations um, with them in my head. Anybody else? Here's how I know. When, I, when I'm having trouble forgiving somebody, I, I, they're right, sitting right in front of me and I start having this fake conversation. And in the conversation, they say that, and then I say this. And, and then they say that, and then, and then I, I come back with this. And then they say that thing, and then I'm like, I knew you were going to bring up that, so now I'm going to bring up this, right? And, and as you're rehearsed, okay, so you're laughing, so I'm, I'm apparently not alone in this, amen? So we start having this fake conversation. We're putting them on trial in our heart. And as we're putting them on trial, as we're going through this interview with them, uh, what happens is anger swells up in us. And at that moment, you know that you haven't forgiven them. You're putting them on trial. And, and, and friends, like, like you are convinced that by not forgiving them, you're keeping them from being able to get away with whatever they did. Uh, but what you're essentially doing is you're drinking poison and waiting, them for, waiting for them to die. That's what unforgiveness does in you. It'll, it'll leave you miserable. And what God is asking you for you to do is not to reconcile the relationship not necessarily. He's not asking for you to trust them the same way again. But he's saying, hey, let it go. I forgave you. You can forgive them. And so as we forgive each other, this is what we're going to learn is that godly character is going to be best produced in godly community. So as I try to grow in compassion, as I try to go in kindness, and as I mess up and I need forgiveness, I need Christian community to keep practicing and growing in these virtues. So here's, here's, the, here's the plug at this point. We, we almost have as many new people in this church as we have older people in this church. And here's, I mean, like people who, are, who have been coming here more than two years, there's almost like the same amount of people that are newer in the last two years that have been coming here a long time, which means like we don't know everybody. And, and, and man, we're trying. We're trying to get people in small groups. We, we are trying to develop and train up small group leaders all the time. And, and we're trying to get people connected. We're trying to get to know everyone and it's tough. And so it feels like it might be a little hard to, to build community in this season. And I'll tell you this, like as a church, we're going to keep having events. And so jump into like the Enneagram group that's coming up here. Get signed up on the website for that. Get signed up. You're like, I don't know what Enneagram is. Well, just sign up and you'll figure it out. It's like a personality profile, okay? It's awesome. Uh, get, go, to, go to a women's ministry thing. Go to a men's ministry thing. Show up at some event that we do. But also, 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 you can do community without the church structuring it. Here's what I just want to lovingly tell you. You can take the person sitting next to you for, to lunch. You could take them today if you wanted to. Like you could see somebody that you don't know and you could have a meal with them and you could enjoy a good drink with them. And, and, and here's, here's how I know this. Look, looking around this room, we're going to spend eternity together. Y'all know that? Like we're going to be in heaven together for a long time. And so why not start getting to know some of these people right now? 
and, I, and I've read the book. In heaven, it's going to be a lot of worshiping Jesus, eating good drink, or I'm sorry, eating good food and drinking good drink. So you can start that practice right now. So, so hear me. Structuring community through the church is important. It's going to be something we always strive for, but we're not going to be perfect at it. Or community happening organically is something you can always pursue on your own. And you need to, because none of this develops. You don't get to practice forgiveness. You don't get to practice kindness on your own. It doesn't work that way. Christian faith is not a solo individual sport. It's a team sport. It's a family that we belong to. As we embrace that, he, Paul says this in Colossians 3.14, and above all else, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And so the highest virtue that we are in pursuit of is love. And it's not love that's cheap. It's not love that's just a word. It's love that's an action. It's not love that's selfish. It's not love that's self-centered. It's love that's self-emptying and self-giving. It's a love on display, not one that just we would hear. Amen? If you really want to just make it as simple as we can, it's the way that Jesus loved us. Jesus loved us so much that he gave himself up for us. And so now the way that we are called to love the world that we're living in is by uh, considering the needs of others before our own, and we sacrifice and we serve and we love people no matter what the cost is going to be for us personally. And that will bind everything together in perfect harmony. He keeps going to say, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Now, when I first read this verse, what I thought that was saying is like, and let your body be in a, in a state of peace. Like, let, let peace reign, rule in my heart. But that's not actually what the word means. The word rule there is actually more like the word umpire or referee. Let the peace of Christ referee in your hearts. Because what he says here, we are all called to live in one body. And so as you live in relationship, how many, of you know, how many of you know when you're in relationship with people, there's going to be a time when there's friction with those people. And I love them, but sometimes I don't love them so much. You know what I'm saying? What, what Paul's writing here is he's saying, and let the peace of Christ, peace is not something that Jesus just gives. It's something that he is. And so let peace be the referee in your relationships. Let Jesus be the referee in your relationships. There was one year, uh, my brother and I, we were looking to make some extra cash. And so we signed up to referee uh, high school basketball, girls and boys. Biggest mistake of my life. Okay. We're refereeing this Mountain View JV game. And, uh, and it was terrible. It, it was going south in a hurry. We'd lost control. And, and we're watching a play happen over here. Uh, and, and in the backcourt over here, uh, this kid tackled another kid. And I'm like, y'all, this is my alma mater, shape up. You know, I didn't really say that, but this kid tackles a kid and there's this like little scuffle and, and one coach is yelling, hey, it was him. he did this. And the other coach is of course yelling the exact opposite. And, and then if you've ever been to a youth sporting event ever, you know that the stands were all screaming at the officials and it was awesome. And I got paid 40 bucks for that game. <laughs> totally worth it. Here's the deal. I was not a perfect referee. Jesus is a perfect referee. He doesn't miss calls. He sees everything. He knows what's going on, not just in action. He knows what's going on in hearts. And so he sees it all. And so as Christians in Christian community, what we're called to do is we're called to, in any sort of rub, any sort of friction, any sort of tension, any sort of offense, we come together with those two people and we say, okay, Jesus, what do you want for this? If you're a husband and wife going through it right now, you have something that's going on, that's something that's serious, something that's deep. You both need to have the position. If you're both believers, then what you need to do is you need to sit down and pray together. You say, God, I want you to reign in this situation. What's your will? And I'll tell you, as soon as you take that posture, if you're roommates, if you're siblings, if you're husband and wife, if you're just friends, as soon as you take that posture when there's an offense, it automatically diffuses the situation because here's what you realize. You're both a little wrong. And what Jesus is going to show you is that, no, actually, he's the only one that's perfect. And you were a little off here, and you were a little off here. And if you want the peace of Christ, the peace that's available in Jesus to reign and to rule, then you've got to let him be the referee. You are not your spouse's Holy Spirit. You are not your friend's Holy Spirit. But if you both together ask the Holy Spirit to bring his peace into a situation, then he will help you. Let's say you're doing that and you're, at a, you're totally at an impasse. You can't reach a decision. Well, that's when you bring in some godly counsel. Get a good friend. Get a good friend who you know loves the Lord. And, and if you're a husband and wife, don't let one of those people be like your dad. 
Get somebody impartial. Get somebody that you just trust. Hey, I love this person's walk with the Lord. Would you just come weigh in on this case? Get a pastor. Get a Christian counselor. Get somebody who will help you just get together and pray. Okay, God, uh, clearly something happened here. What do you want for this situation? Help all parties see just what your will is for this situation. Because we're called to be one body. And so even though we're going to have some things that disagree a little bit, even though we're going to have some friction at some point, we're called to be one body. And so this is the, this is the call for, for Christian community, is to let Jesus be the referee. 3.16, he goes on to say, this is the last one. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And this is where we let God's word form God's community. So the third part of putting on the life that's available in Christ is by letting God's word get into your bones. And I think there's, there's a couple things that this word of Christ uh, phrase can mean. It's certainly for the Colossian church, when they're reading this, they're thinking the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let the word of Jesus Christ dwell in you richly, which means let the gospel penetrate deep into your soul. You need to be reminded of the gospel over and over again. God loves you. He saved you. He's for you. He will not let you go over and over and over. And we never graduate from the gospel. There's no greater news than the gospel ever. And so this is, this is what Paul is pointing all the way up to in the book of Colossians. He's saying, hey, Jesus is preeminent. He's above all things. He's greater than all things. He's more valuable than everything. It's Jesus. Root yourself in him. Establish yourself in him. Be found in him. And it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let that dwell in you richly. We never move on from it, folks. The gospel needs reminding to our souls all the time, all the time. But it also means for us, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. What we can take from that now 2,000 years removed from this letter is we can say, no, uh, it's let the word of Christ dwell in me richly. The Colossian church did not have this book. It wasn't finished yet. We have this book. And so we can, look, we can look back at the Old Testament. We can look back at the other epistles. We can look back at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we can say, okay, wait, what was it like living, walking, breathing with Jesus? And, and, we, and we can take everything that we need questions for, our marriage, our relationships, our parenting, everything is to be found in this book. It informs every part of our lives. And I let this word dwell in me richly, teaching me and admonishing me teaching and admonishing. That word admonishing is like literally getting it into your head. Let the word, let this book get in your head. Spend time reading it. Spend time chewing on it. Listen to other people teach on it. Talk with it with your, talk about it with your friends. Get, get into it. And I, I love that he attaches here, at teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. If you, if you missed Caden's message on worship a few weeks ago, you, you need to go back and watch it because he unpacked this a little bit and he gave us just, I think, a little more context and a little uh, a deeper gear for praise. But what I think this can also simply mean is just, man, sing God's word. Sing God's word. Can I tell you something about singing? It's sticky. Singing's sticky. I, I know this stupid state song from third grade and it's not because I rehearse it every day. Alabama, Alaska, Arizona, Arkansas, California, Colorado, Connecticut, doo -doo -doo, and then it keeps going, right? Like, people are like, do you know all 50 states? I'm like, yes, in alphabetical order, because <laughs> I can sing it, <laughs> right? Like, you can, like, parents, I hope you don't miss this point. You can sing songs over your kids right now. You can get your kids singing songs on the radio while they're still stuck in the back seat, unable to, unable to turn, turn the radio station. And you can just let God's word marinate in them. Like, like, check this out. You're going to remember Baby Shark until the day you die. <laughs> you just are. You're not going to be able to get it out of your head for the rest of today. And you're going to be 80 years old and someone will be like, Baby Shark. And you'll be like, doo, 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 ah, you know what I mean? You'll lose your mind. Like, Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible. Tell, do you know what I mean? It's, you, can, you can sing these songs. You can put this truth and tuck it deep into your hearts. I don't care if you're a kid in the room. I don't care if you're 80 years old. Song works in the same way. It's sticky, it's memorable, it gets God's truth in us because that let the word of Christ dwell in you richly is like this picture of tea. Like some of, some, some of us, like you get in the morning and you're on your couch and you read your verse of the day and it's one verse and that's good, but it's just like dipping the tea bag in and out real quick. Like how many of you know, you need to like, you need to let that soak for a little bit. I'm cool if you want to read one verse a day, but think on it, chew on it. 
ask yourself, God, what, what are you teaching me right now? What does this mean for me today? And so check it out. God's, God's word has to form his community. And we got to know it. We got to get in it. You got to pursue it on your own. We're going to open it up every single week when we gather on Sundays. But, but do you eat one meal a week? Is that how you roll? No, we need, we need daily substance, daily bread. I need fresh manna every day. I need to get in God's word all the time. Get in it, read it, know it, chew on it. Let it steep in your soul. And here's, here's what's on the table. If we can do this, it goes into verse 17. And Paul says, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So, so if you can embrace God's identity that he's freely offered to you, and if you can start to let his character come out of you rather than you try and just like uh, demonstrate his character just through your own might, but if you can embrace his identity and let that start to transform you, then, then what's going to happen is you're going to need to practice that, uh, those, that character a little bit. So you need to get in Christian community. You need to hang out with other people who believe the same things. You know, I'm not saying all your friends need to be Christians, but you get in Christian community and you grow and you develop and we forgive each other when we mess up and we continue to pursue all the attributes that Jesus has for us as a community. And on top of that, what we do is we just, we get in front of this book and we just let it form us. We let it form us. And if we can do that, then whatever we end up doing, whether we're at the gym, whether we're at coffee, whether we're in word, talking to a friend, talking to a coworker, or whether we're in deed, whether we're showing up at somebody's house and bringing them a meal, whether we're just hanging out with a neighbor, like whatever we do in word or deed, you're going to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so your whole life is going to start to point to what Jesus has done in you. And this is, this is what's so, so, I think, paramount for the church to grasp right now is that we're not really, like we're facing a problem in culture where culture seems to be drifting darker and darker. But the real problem that I think we're facing in the church is that the church is not doing these things. We're not putting to death what's still earthly in us, and we're neglecting to walk in the life that's offered to us. And so as a result of that, our, our witness is failing in some sense, because we're acting like certain people, but then we're really lacking the transformation. We're still wearing the dirty camping clothes. And we're like, come on in, it's great. And we're like, you're gross. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I'm not, I'm not trying to say that to create this like, okay, I've got to clean everything up. I, remember the message embrace the identity that God's offering to you. Let that renew you. Get in some community. Get around some friends. Take somebody to lunch who's willing to pursue that with you. And then by, like, get in the book. Get in the book. Read it. Sing it. Let it steep in your soul. And if we can do that, then, then the church will really look a certain way that I think would, would honestly be appealing to those around us. Not everyone. There's going to be those who, who hate us no matter what we do. Absolutely. But, but, the witness then becomes all the more bright and everything that we end up doing, they're going to say, there's something different about that person. And we're going to have the opportunity to say, it's Jesus in me. It's the life of Jesus on me. I don't walk like that anymore. I've made, uh, that, that part of me is dead and gone. I'm pursuing this now. So church, would you stand and pray with me? God, this is our hope. I pray, just even as we're sitting in this room, um, we, we came here today uh, because we want to know more of who you are. And we want to know more about the life that you've offered to us. And this abundant life that's on the table is found in us putting to death what's still earthly in us and then taking and receiving the free life that you're offering to us. So I, God, I, I just pray that um, for those struggling to embrace their identity today, God, would you meet them in that? And would you just remind them that they are chosen and holy and loved because of you. They're loved by you. For people who are lonely today, or for people who have just maybe been hanging around for a long time and they've neglected to engage in the community that's here, would you help them see the family that's in this room for them today? Would you help them know that there's friends and there's family sitting across rows in aisles with them right now? And God, would you help us always, always, always cling to your word and your truth? It's all we want. It's all we're after. We love you, Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.